I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, don't miss this. Your faith minister to you. But what I want you to see today is that there is a place in God where your own personal faith Amen. can keep you well Amen. all the days of your life. Amen. Now, before I close, I've got to help you with something. Everything, and this is the right, you know, I've never preached on healing in 40 years, regardless of how I've approached it, where somebody doesn't come to me after the service with some question. Well, if that's really the way God intended it to be, then how do you explain this? Let me help you with something. Everything God teaches in the Bible, he teaches in perfection. Don't miss this. This is not a third grade thing that I'm going to teach, so pay attention. There's some depth and meat on this bone, but I want you to grasp it. With God's help, I'm going to do my best to carefully articulate it. Everything God teaches, he teaches in perfection. Now, what does that mean specifically? For example, he said, be thou holy, even as I am holy. He taught righteousness and right living and holiness in perfection. He said, be thou holy as I, God the Father, am holy. But no human being has ever met that standard. No human being has ever been as holy as God. But that was his standard. Be thou holy like I am. Then he taught in another place, be thou perfect even as I am perfect. So then he began to teach not only right and holy living, but complete living subtracted from all imperfections. I don't know anybody perfect. I'm not perfect, not even close. I'm not as holy as God, not even close. But that's the standard that he asked me to shoot for. Then in other places, we see Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God, who healed all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, and whoever came to him walked away whole. Does everybody that I pray for have an instantaneous healing? No, but that's my target. I don't pray for people thinking, well, if somebody doesn't get healed, I'm going to quit preaching on healing. Or if somebody doesn't get healed, then I'm going to quit preaching faith. No, his standard is always perfection. Yes. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Now, once you understand that God is perfect, so therefore everything that God teaches us is taught in a standard of perfection with no room for error, then you have to realize that doctrine is like a target. Whatever doctrine you're preaching or teaching on, you must view through spiritual eyes as a target. Now, I can take a child. Now, I like to hunt. I like the great outdoors. If killing animals is a sin, please pray for me. <laughs> but vegetarianism is not biblical. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Vegetarian is an old biblical word in the original Hebrew that means man who cannot hunt. <laughs> Lord, I apologize. That's not what that means. But I can prove to you through science, God gave human beings incisors. All animals that were created to eat meat have incisors. They are created for shredding meat. All animals that God created to chew vegetables, grasses, greeneries, and are vegetarian by nature, they all have flat teeth. Think of a cow. Maybe not. <laughs> They're pretty ugly. Maybe don't dwell on that. 
But I'm here to tell you that even in the last days, people don't realize that's a, that's a Bible prophecy. In the last days, people will forbid the eating of meat. Now listen, if I were to take a young child out and I was going to teach them to hunt, I said, Tiff, you know, I've always wanted to shoot an Alaska moose or an Alaska caribou or whatever they're wanting to hunt. I said, well, let's do it with bow. All right, teach me how to shoot the bow. And I were to take that young person out into a field and set up the target. Let's say we just walk 25 yards away. In 25 paces, we turn around, we face the target. I give him three arrows. And I show him all of the mechanics as to how to properly shoot a bow, how to hold it, how to release it, how to focus. All of those fundamentals have already been covered, but now's the time to experiment. And the child draws the bow back and releases the arrow, and it flies 10 yards over the top of the target. Not even close. I wouldn't discourage the kid and say, you know what? Maybe you better stay in the basement with your mother for the rest of your life playing video games. <laughs> No, I wouldn't discourage the kid. I'd say, hey, you got two more arrows, let's try again. And so he draws his bow, and he overcorrects, and he shoots that one in the dirt 10 yards short of the target. So now you overcorrected. Try about halfway in between shooting high and shooting low. Let's see how close you can get this third one. You're doing good. And the third arrow is at the perfect height, but it's left of the target and misses the target, even though it was very close. Would it be logical for me to tell that young boy or young girl, well, here's what we've learned today. The target doesn't exist. <laughs> of course not. As foolish as that is to tell that child, the target doesn't exist when he can see the target right there. That's what Christians do with divine healing. That's what Christians do with miracles. That's what Christians do with signs and wonders. That's what Christians do with the supernatural because they've never been able to figure it out, because it's never worked for them, because they've never hit the target, they say, well, I guess that Bible truth doesn't exist. And you're as foolish as the child. Because what the child really needs to do is have someone that keeps helping him. Yeah. Say, listen, let's go get those three arrows and let's try again. And maybe after shooting five or 10 or 15 arrows, finally, the kid hits the target. It's on the last ring, but he hit the target. And now he's jumping up and down and he's excited and he's screaming, I hit it, but he didn't get anywhere near the bullseye, but he hit the target. That is how the child of God has to understand biblical doctrine. God always teaches every truth in the Bible in bullseye definition. Perfection, center of the target, be thou holy, be thou perfect, Jesus healed all. Everything that was taught by the Godhead was taught in bullseye fashion. The truth is, if you're missing the target of whatever God taught in the Bible, quit condemning yourself or worse yet saying, that works for some, but it's never worked for me. And give yourself to a greater study of the Bible. <laughs> Sit under ministries that have the anointing that hits the target. If you, don't miss this, if you want a gift, you must sit under a gift. If you want a gift, you must sit under a gift. You cannot teach a child how to shoot a bow and arrow properly if you have no ability to shoot a bow and arrow. Somebody has to teach that child that has done it before and knows how to make it happen and can see what the child is doing wrong and make systematic corrections and practice and be patient and encourage. And the kid might have to do some push-ups on a regular basis to develop some strength to pull the string. You may have to diagnose what it is that child needs until they're able to put meat on the table. Don't give up on them. And my word to you tonight is if the Bible's not been working for you, don't say the target doesn't exist. Get before God in humility in your prayer life and say, God, there's a whole lot of room for teaching in this area on my life. Patiently teach me, mentor me, put people in my life that know what they're talking about until I can start putting arrows on the target and make the devil nervous. I'm 
what I'm trying to teach. <laughs> Just because you don't see it in perfection, working in your own life, does not mean that it's not the will of God. It may mean that there's a whole lot of room for improvement. I close with why people don't hit the target and then we'll pray. As I read this story to you, this woman did four very unique things. Number one, the Bible said in verse 27 of Mark 5, if you still have your Bible, I trust that you do. The Bible said she had heard the reports about Jesus. The power of the supernatural has a whole lot to do with what you allow in your ears. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, write it down. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That's why I always tell churches. Make sure you have the best sound system you possibly have. And buying the best sound equipment doesn't mean you'll have good sound. Because you can buy the best car that's available and give the keys to a kid and he'll crash it. So you have to have sound equipment that somebody in the house at least knows how to run. And sometimes the best equipment is not the best equipment because you don't have people with the best knowledge to run it. But anything a church does that improves sound and improves media improves hearing. And anything that improves hearing improves faith. Yeah. I've been to churches. They hand me the microphone. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to open up to me with the book of Hebrews chapter 6. You know, who can listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> sound guy's been to the Helen Keller School of Audio oh. Technically. <laughs> you know, you got you to do a little better than that. Anybody been to a church like that, or is it just me? <laughs> Built a million dollar church and spent forty-seven ninety-five on an Amazon sound system. <laughs> Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Hearing is important. Don't miss this. Listen carefully. It matters who you allow to speak to you. Amen. It matters who you listen to. There are only two kinds of people in your life. People that are charging your battery and people that are draining your battery. Amen. And if you're wise, you will execute in your mind a very clear line and circle as to who those people are. And you will be careful with people that drain your battery not to allow them to rob you of time and morale. Many people have fallen into sin simply because they allowed the wrong people in their life to speak into their ears. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now some of you may not even be aware of it, but the very fact that you made an effort to get to church tonight, that tells me that you're a very special person. Because the average person never makes time to hear the Bible. Now, we've all been to churches that we'd rather have our eye burn out with a poker than go back. Some churches are just torture to sit through. I've been in some churches where I went to the church, I was so encouraged, so up, so positive, and after hanging out in their church for two days, I had lost the will to live. So I understand why some unsaved people don't want to go to church. But this church isn't like that. This church has made room this week for the word of God to be preached. Yeah. And for example, I'll, I'll just be real specific, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. But, uh, you know, I look back and I see three young men sitting in a church on a Monday night. Yeah. That tells me that they're different than a lot of the men that are walking around yeah. in this community. Because yeah. very few young men in our society are man enough to go to church. But as my father used to say, a man never stands taller than when he's on his knees before God in prayer. Let me tell you something, my dad was not a sissy. My dad was a big brute of a man. 
There was not one sin in my life or my brother's life that my father didn't believe he could beat out of us. <laughs> but my father taught me that a real man makes time for God because you can't be who God created you to be without the power of God in your life. You're always going to be struggling under the curse of sin and peer pressure. That's right. So when I was singing tonight and saw these young men in church, uh, I, I just was excited because we need a revival of young men in America. Oh, yeah. We need a revival of young men in America. Because the truth is, by and large, we quit making men in America in the mid-80s. You can't hardly tell the men from the women anymore in this society. So anytime I see a man that looks like a man, I'm always happy because they quit making them. But I apologize, maybe or maybe not. I'm not sure exactly how you, how you fall on that line, Lord. I'm just telling you, we need a revival of men in the house of God. Look back and see this big brute of a guy in church on a Monday night. Now, if I was in a bar fight and I'm looking around the church and thinking, who would I want in a bar fight with me? I'm going with him first. <laughs> we need a revival of men. I don't know about you, I'm so sick and tired of preachers in skinny jeans and pink t-shirts and hairdos and manicures. Give us men who know how to hold a Bible in their hand and say, thus saith the Lord. It matters what you listen to. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then number two, she believed it. The Bible said in Mark chapter 5 that she said to herself, if I can just but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be made well. She was able to believe something because she heard something. If you hear right, you'll believe right. But if you hear wrong, you'll believe wrong. That's why it's important to make sure that wherever you're receiving Bible teaching, that they start in the Bible, stay in the Bible, and finish in the Bible. Yeah. Because if you're not hearing right, you're not going to believe right. And if you're not believing right, you're not going to live right. And if you're not living right, you can't expect right. Number one, it matters what you hear. Number two, it matters what you believe. Matthew 13, verse 57. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his own family. And so he did only a few miracles there because of their unbelief. In this passage, we see that Jesus was actually handcuffed in his ability to do what he wanted to do because of their unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not believing right, then you won't be able to have the supernatural power of God in your life like he wills and wants. Mm -hmm. right. I've had people when I've preached on healing through the years come up to me afterwards and say, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. That's just your opinion. It's not my opinion. I don't believe, you know, and most of them are dead. Amen. Because if you don't believe it, you can't receive it. Yes. Right. Right. Amen. If you don't believe it, you can't receive it. Right. But I've seen people who, when it looked like there was no way, reached up in their weakness and in their infirmity and in their trial and say, Lord, I don't know why I'm going through this, but in the name of Jesus, I believe that you can raise me up out of this. Amen. And I will not die. I will live in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you can turn hopeless situations yes. around just by the ability to believe yes. right. Yes. But if you don't know, if no one has ever taught you, 
that you need to be saved. Now listen carefully. All of the blessings and promises of God begin with the day of salvation. These are the promises of God to his children. If you reject God and say, I don't want to be a child of God. I don't want to serve the Lord. I don't want to be a Christian. Then you have the right to do that. But you just need to clearly understand that there's only two people you can serve. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. It's just that simple. There's no in between. I think it was Bob Dylan that had a song. You'll either serve the Lord or you'll serve the devil, but you're going to serve somebody. Even an unsaved rock artist was smart enough to know the spiritual truth that you were either on your way to heaven or you're on your way to hell. You're either serving the Lord or you're serving the devil. You're either walking under the curse of sin or you're walking under the blessing of God. You're either walking under the forgiveness of the Father or you're living under the guilt and shame of the consequence of your choices. It's your choice. I had a professor many years ago from New York University that came into one of my meetings. The only reason he came into the meeting was good friends of his who were Christians invited him. I happened to bump into him and those people in the parking lot coming into church early. And that professor just looked me in the eye and told me, I'm really not interested in evangelists or preachers. I'm here tonight because these people are dear friends and they've invited me so many times that I felt like I had to come at least once. I mean, he just flat out told me he could care less about listening to me. He's there because they were good friends. I'm fine with that. I didn't come to hear him. So we're, we're equal. That night, I happened to be preaching a message. I still remember it entitled, The Hard Truth About Hell. And at the end, when I gave the invitation, I found out later that he was under conviction, but he didn't come forward. The next night in that meeting, I think it was a Thursday night, he came back. Oftentimes I'm at the church early. I've been here since 1145, haven't left the grounds. But I was at the church early that, that night, came in early, tuned my guitar, and get things ready for the music, the service, and pray, and prepare. And uh, he's in the parking lot in his car waiting for me. So when he sees me, he's already there. He gets out of his vehicle and kind of trots up beside me. And he's walking with me to the church. And he said, thanks to you, I didn't sleep a, a wink last night. I said, what? He said, thanks to you, I didn't sleep a wink last night. I said, what did I do to ruin your sleep? He said, you know, I have to first of all apologize. Because last night when I met you in the parking lot with those people, I was actually really nervous. I had never been to church in my life. Told me he was the professor and subject, tenure and so on. He said, I actually had a little bit of scotch before I came to calm my nerves. And sometimes when I drink a little, I say things I shouldn't say. And I think I probably insulted you last night. I said, no, it didn't bother me at all. And it didn't. And uh, I said, tell me about not being able to sleep last night and why that's my fault. He said, well, first of all, he said, I really enjoyed the music. And he said, then I really enjoyed the Bible. I, I was not expecting what, what you were going to do. I didn't know what to expect, he said. But he said at the end, when you gave that invitation, he said, it was like somebody had a hold of my heart pulling me to that altar. And I wanted to go, but I didn't. I said, well, why didn't you go? He said, because maybe it's my intellectual side. But I said to myself, don't respond to an emotional invitation. Just be neutral and think it through. He said, I had no sooner thought in my mind just to remain neutral and think about it. When you pointed your finger out over that audience of over 600 people and said, don't think for a minute you could remain neutral. And he said, it was like you were pointing right at me. <laughs> And he said, it freaked me out, if I'm honest. He said, because my intellectual professor's side had just thought, just don't respond to an emotional invitation. Just for tonight, remain neutral. And no sooner had the thought gone through my mind, remain neutral. And you pointed your finger out right at me and said, <laughs> don't think for a moment you can remain neutral. And I went home. I usually have the same routine at night. I usually have a couple of fingers of expensive scotch, grade some papers till I'm tired, turn out the lights, go to bed. 
He said, I had my couple fingers of scotch, graded some papers, went to bed. And he said, I shut out the lights. And he said, normally I fall right asleep. He said, but I was wide awake. And all of a sudden I heard, don't think for a moment. You can remain no further. And he said, I laid there and tried to block you out of my mind. And he said, I just started drifting off to sleep. And all of a sudden, he said, I startled and woke up because I heard, don't think for a moment. And he said, all night long, I could not sleep a wink. And the sun rose, and I got up and had to start my day without any sleep. He said, that's never happened to me before. What do you think God was trying to tell me? <laughs> You got your PhD work? <laughs> I said, I'm going to take a wild guess that he's telling you, you can't remain neutral. <laughs> and I'm going to tell him and tell you the same thing. There's only two things you can do with Jesus Christ. You can receive him or you can reject him. But you cannot remain neutral. Because when you stand before God in eternity's morning, there's not going to be a neutral. The Bible says, he that hath the Son hath life, and he who hath not the Son hath not life. Jesus said, either your father is God or your father is the devil. No neutral in that, not to mention not one shred of political correctness. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that abruptly. Either your father is God or your father is the devil. So it matters what you listen to. Number three, she said it. Look at verse 28 of Mark 5. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Don't miss this before we pray. If your words don't agree with God's words, you cannot have what God said. Amen. If your words do not agree with what God said, you cannot have what he said. The book of Proverbs puts it this way. The power of life and death is in the tongue. The Bible said, either your tongue speaks life or your tongue speaks death. When your mouth betrays the covenant of the Bible, you handcuff the ability of Christ to operate in that dimension of your life. If you were to ask me the number one thing that I see in Christians' lives that keep them from experiencing the supernatural power of God, it's this. They say they believe the Bible, but they've never spiritually disciplined their tongue to agree with the contents of its holy pages. Now sometimes I've preached through the years on the importance of words and people get all upset and say, you one of them, name it and claim it. Pre no, I'm a Bible preacher. I started in the Bible tonight. I stayed in the Bible tonight. I'm finishing in the Bible tonight. And just for the record, when it comes to what some people might call confession, you can't even get saved without right confession. Because Romans chapter 10 says, if a man believes in his heart and confesses with his mouth, the Lord Jesus, he shall be saved. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. James said that God can't tolerate sweet water and bitter water coming out of the same tongue. The Bible says by your words you'll be justified or by your words you'll be condemned. You see, the Lord taught me early on in my ministry as a young man. Because you're going to travel all over the world and your schedule is going to be different than the average person and you're going to eat stuff in foreign countries that could hurt and harm your body, you're going to have to learn to supernaturally walk in my protection. 
And God taught me as a young man, one of the first things to walking in the supernatural blessing of God is make sure that your words never betray what he said in the Bible. So because God said that Jesus Christ died for the healing of my body, I don't talk about sickness, disease, and pain, and aches. Amen. Not that I don't have them from time to time, but when the enemy attacks my physical body, it's not that I'm living in Scientology or denial. I just have a choice as to how I'm going to speak. And so if the devil attacks my body, I start saying things like, Father, I thank you today that you have power to touch my body. Amen. And even though I live in a physical body, the Bible said that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens my mortal body. So Father, I thank you today for quickening my mortal body. I thank you, Lord, that no sickness, disease, or infirmity has power over the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed me and purified me and made me your own. I thank you, Lord, that the same Jesus who forgave my sins heals my diseases. For the Bible says, who forgiveth our sins and healeth our diseases. And I've learned that through the years, you can make up your mind how you're going to talk. And instead of giving place to the devil and allowing him to put a foot in the door and enter your life and attack you in areas that he's not authorized to attack, make up your mind you're going to say over your life what the Bible says over your life. Yeah. Learn enough of the Bible, and until you figure out what the Bible has to say about it, sit down and shut up and study. And get the Word of God into your heart, and once you learn what the Bible says about it, then cover your life with the power of the anointed scripture. For the power of God is a light unto our path. It is a lamp. It is a sword. It is a shield. It is a glory. It is a covering. And the power of the Bible still defeats every work of the devil. Yeah. Matthew chapter 4. Every time Jesus was tempted of the devil, what did he say? It is written. It is written. And he quoted an appropriate scripture to the area of temptation. If the very Son of God knew enough to keep his words in agreement with the Father, how much more must you and I do the same? Some of you walk down the grocery aisles at the store, and your kids reach up for something. And you backhand them and say, we can't afford that. We're poor. Quit it. Start saying, not today, son. But God's about to bless our family. And I know it's coming. And we're one day going to be able to afford anything on any shelf in this store. Matter of fact, if I get crazy enough, I might buy the, just buy the store. And start talking crazy faith. Yes. Because crazy faith will take you a whole lot farther than poor mouth and breathe that into your kids. Yeah. Don't do that. I'm not telling you to deny things that aren't true. Learn how to talk the Bible. Yes. When my son was born, we didn't have a home. We were homeless. Judy and I came back to the house. We were staying at our mother's that particular uh, day, and it was the first night I had my son home in the bedroom there. And I remember laying him on the pillow and looking into his eyes, and thanking God for a healthy son. But one of the first things I ever said over my son is I reached over and I laid my hands on his little head. And I said, you don't know it yet, but one day you're gonna be a great, Man, praise God. God. And I spoke that over him all of his life. And I do to this day. When my daughter was born, I laid hands on my little baby girl, Jessica. And I said, Jessica, you don't know it yet. But one day you're going to be a great woman of God. But there are going to be a lot of stupid people who will tell you that God doesn't use women. They're liars. Amen. God loves you. That's He's right. anointed you. Amen. His spirit is poured out upon sons and daughters. Amen. So your daddy's going to bless you all the days of your life. 
and my daughter is a great woman of God. She and her husband pastor a church in Montreal that's grown from 200 to 700. They're in a building project of $11 million. They're $9 million in cash. God's provided miraculously for them because what I am preaching to you works. And when my daughter preaches and I listen to her, I always tell my son-in-law, my goal for you, my prayer for you is that one day you'll be able to preach half as well as my daughter can. <laughs> because she's a preaching machine. Now she's not coarse and she's not harsh. She's a beautiful little lady. But young women and women that are listening to me, don't let anybody ever tell you that because you're a woman that God has written you off. Don't let any religious spirit ever confess over you because you're a woman that you're half of what a man should be. You are a child of God just like I'm a child of God and the same promises of God that he gave to me, he gave to you. We need all of the church, all of the church, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl standing on the promises of God and declaring the truth of the Lord while we still have time for the sound of the trumpet is soon. And I want to live ready. How about you? Amen. Come on, just give God a mighty hand of praise if you believe in us. Hallelujah. The path to miracles and the supernatural. First of all, Hebrews 1 3, everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. You must study the life of Jesus in the New Testament. Because proportionately, what you know about Jesus hinges upon how you yourself will live and receive from God. Number two, there are three things that every person who walks in the supernatural power of God understand. It matters what you say. Amen. It matters what you hear. And it matters what you believe. If you don't hear right, you can't believe right. And if you don't believe right, you can't say right. But once you begin to know what the covenant of God is, for example, Deuteronomy 28, you'll be blessed coming in and you'll be blessed going out. Your basket will be blessed. Your storehouse will be blessed. And you begin to learn these things of God. And on days when the devil's trying to get you down and depressed, you can just start walking around and laugh in the face of the devil. Devil, are you crazy? Don't you know that I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out? The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, don't miss this. No good thing does he withhold from them that That's walk right. upright. Amen. 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 I'm planning on preaching, by the way, on the blessing of God tomorrow night. What does the Bible really say about prosperity? If we're going to reach the lost in the last days, then we have to come to a place where we're not suffering lack. The work of God should never suffer lack. We should always be able to do the will and the work of God. As I told the class today, I had a man that came to me not long ago. said, Tiff, it's not that I don't believe in that blessing that's in the Bible, but I have everything I need. My wife and I have a little home. We love it. We've been in it for years and years. We've got a little piece of property. Everything we have is paid for. We own it. I'm driving a better pickup truck than I ever thought I'd ever drive. We don't have anything else in our life that we need. We never lack for food. We're just humble people, thankful for what God has done. I said, you selfish little foolish Christian or something of that nature. He looked at me and said, what? I said, the blessing of God has a whole lot more to do than your little cabin and your little truck and your little plan and your little dream. I said, wouldn't you love to be able to send some kid in your church that was called into the ministry but couldn't afford it? Wouldn't you love to be able to be blessed enough to pull that boy or that girl aside and say, listen, I know that you came from nothing. I know your parents don't support you, but God's called you into the ministry. My wife and I are gonna pay for all of your Bible college education. Wouldn't you like to be able to do that? Amen. Yes, that's good. Wouldn't you like to be able, some ministry comes around and says this year, God has laid it upon our heart to build a church in a village in Alaska, and we need X amount of dollars to build that church in that village. 
We need to figure out a way for God to support a pastor in that village. Wouldn't you like to be blessed enough to come up to that person and say, listen, my wife and I are going to pay for the church and we're going to support that pastor for the first five years. You see what I'm trying to tell you? The blessing of God is not content. Listen, the blessing of God is not connected just to temporary stuff. The blessing of God is connected to eternal stuff. The Bible said, Paul spoke these words to Timothy, Godliness is profitable yeah. unto all things, both in the life now and in the life that is to come. The true blessing of the Lord is to help you in this life, but it is also to make sure that we have deposited treasures in heaven. And no one in this church should ever dare speak against the blessing of God. Because the last time I checked, somebody that God blessed and prospered is building your church for cash. When these religious people start hammering against the blessing of God and the prosperity of God, it ticks me off. Because the work of God needs funded. Right. Missions need funded. Feeding the poor needs funded. I'm not one that would deprive you of anything. I don't care if you drive the best vehicle ever made. I rejoice with you. I'm just telling you that the blessing of God is not just to bless you so that you can hoard it, but that so you can get connected to the great mission of God to reach the lost before it's eternally too late. Just for the record, I practice what I preach. Praise the Lord. Our ministry gave more money away last year than we made in our first year multiplied by probably 20. I want to be a blessing. I'm chairman of a board at a Bible college, and we've got international students that are applying for the school but can't afford board, tuition, books, clothes. We had a kid that got saved in Somalia. When he got saved, the only thing that he had was a loincloth. Both parents dead from AIDS before they were in their 40s. Got saved and somehow he connected with the school. I'm glad God blessed Lost Lamb enough that we could pay his bill. God has to help us to understand that until we get the supernatural power of God in agreement with the book in our lives, we're going to fall short of the target. And it's too late. Jesus is about to come. It's too late for us to start believing anything else than we'd better up our game. Yeah. Yeah. I said we'd better up our game as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time to quit playing church as usual. We've got to up our game. We've got to take this thing with a greater sense of urgency to a place that we've never believed for. We'll never regret doing the will and the work of God. Come on and give God a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah. Stand your feet with me, please. I don't want to apologize because I don't believe in apologizing for preaching the Bible, but I'm going to do my best to be done every night before 9. And last time I looked up at the clock, it was 8.57. And uh, your Alaska clock just goes so quick. It's a little after 9. But listen. I say this because if you're inviting guests, I want them to know the services aren't going to be eternal. Uh, we'll be done by, and let me tell you something. There's nothing on TV or the internet worth running home to better than what you can receive in the presence of the Lord. You'll never get healed watching forensic files. You'll never get blessed watching build this old home. God has the keys to your blessings. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand, blessings forevermore. Getting yourself underneath the Bible will change your life. I always tell people that are new in Christ, stay with me for at least a year. Stay with Mossland for at least a year. We'll send you all the materials for free, no charge. Stay with me for at least a year. I guarantee you that if you'll allow your life to be under the teaching. Of God's holy word for a year, you'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. Before I pray for those of you that have special needs, I never preach. Those of you that know our ministry, I told you the first thing. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give people an opportunity to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. 
I said in the beginning of the message, but I want to say it one more time. Don't miss it. Do you have a clear, distinct memory? Don't miss it. Let me tell you how important this is. Literally, whether you spend eternity in heaven or hell depends upon your answer. So don't miss this. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've gotten down on bended knees in the presence of a holy God and say, God, I know I've sinned. I know I've broken commandments. I know I've failed you. But in childlike faith, I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I trust in Christ and the cross and the blood you shed. Make me the man or the woman that I ought to be. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've ever done that? And I'm asking you, have you ever done it personally and have you ever done it publicly? Why do I say personally? Because nobody can do it for you. I can't do it for you as much as I would. I wish I could. I wish every place I went, I could personally make that decision for you, but I can't. It's a personal decision. Two things you can do with Jesus, I said earlier, you can only do two things personally. You can receive him or you can reject him. Why do I say publicly? Because Jesus said, if you confess me, Luke chapter 12, if you confess me publicly before men, I will confess you publicly before my Father which is in heaven. But if you are ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the angels. Luke 12. Everybody Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. When he died on the cross, he died publicly. When he comes again, he's coming publicly. Billy Graham used to say, there's something about doing it publicly that seals it and makes it sure. There was a man in the service Sunday that came up to me afterwards and said, you mentioned Billy Graham visiting from Los Angeles, California in the service Sunday. He said, when you mentioned Billy Graham, he said, I just thought you might like to know. Somebody took me to a Billy Graham crusade when I was 10 years old. And he said the same thing. I remember it. And I went forward publicly at 10 years old in a Billy Graham crusade. Gave my heart to Jesus. I was here in the church from Los Angeles visiting family, I think, niece or somebody. So I'm going to ask you to do it publicly. Say, hey, that's going to take humility. That's going to take courage. That's going to take faith. Exactly. It doesn't take any strength or courage or humility to follow the crowd. It doesn't take any character or humility to follow your friends and live in peer pressure. That's just like falling in a river and floating with the current. It doesn't take any skill whatsoever. Dead bodies float with the current. But it's going to take strength and humility to live a Christian life. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm asking you to receive Jesus and to make a personal and a public commitment and to be humble enough to say, God, I don't understand everything about the Bible or everything about Christianity or everything that man said, but I do know that I'm a sinner and I do know that I've broken stuff in the Bible I shouldn't have broken and I want to be right with God. If there's a heaven, I want to go. If there's a hell, I don't want to go. God, by faith tonight, I'm going to pray. I'm going to taste and see if the Lord is good. Give God a chance. You'll never regret the day you made peace with God. Wouldn't you like to go home tonight and lay your head to the pillow and maybe for the first time in your life go to sleep with peace in your heart knowing if the Lord comes tonight, I'm ready to go. Nothing like that. So in just a moment, they're going to sing this song that says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. As they do, I'm going to kneel at this altar and wait for you. Not going to keep you. Not going to embarrass you. We're going to pray what many people call a sinner's prayer. But I always ask those of you that have the courage when they begin to sing the song, you be the very first ones to come. Why? Because your courage might help somebody else. I heard last night there was someone that got saved and I heard their sisters are coming tonight because their sisters are going to make their public commitment tonight. If those sisters are here, I'm going to challenge you to make your commitment to the Lord tonight. This preacher loves you. I'd like to pray for you. 
but it's going to be your decision. Christian, I'm going to ask you to do what I've asked in every service at the invitation. When the invitation is given, if you're next to someone, sitting by someone, and you're not sure if they've ever given their heart to Christ, I want you to turn to them and just say, I'll walk with you. That might be the only encouragement they need. And the truth is, that might take more courage for you as a Christian to ask than it'll take courage for them to come. They might just need that encouragement. And if God's speaking to your heart, you need to make peace with God. If you're backslidden away from the Lord and you need to come home, this applies to you as well. You start coming right now as they sing and then we're going to pray. Come on. Christian men just come and kneel beside them. When people make commitments to Christ, they need to know that there are other men that serve God that support them. They have a saying in the military, no man left behind. I believe the church ought to have the same mentality. No men left behind in Soldatna. No men left behind in Kenai. As they're playing that very softly, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me out loud. Listen, repeating prayers with preachers, priests, evangelists, rabbis, repeating preachers' prayers is not what forgives sin and makes your heart right with God. The only reason I'm asking you to pray a prayer with me is because a lot of people don't know exactly what they should pray. But here's the promise of God, and this is straight out of the Bible. The Bible says... Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the promise of God. Prayer is just talking to God from a sincere heart. Now, I know you're sincere. You wouldn't have come forward. It took faith, courage, humility, and sincerity to be where you're at. So I don't want you to think for a moment that God's going to turn you away. Or this is Russian roulette that you're going to pray. And some of you he'll forgive and some of you he won't. No. He said all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By faith, without whispering, you're not talking to God in shame. He's your heavenly father. Just pray this with me out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, tonight as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I confess my sin. God, you know everything that I've ever done. There is nothing in my life hidden from your eyes. So I not only confess my sin, but I repent. In childlike faith, I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in the cross and the blood that was shed for my salvation. 
Cleanse me. Cleanse my mind, my body and spirit. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Tonight by faith, I receive salvation as the gift of God. And I vow I will serve the Lord. I need you to help me because I can't do it on my own. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to be what I ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Awesome. Those, those of you guys that prayed that prayer, there's an altar worker there. They'll probably ask if you need a Bible. They have some material. Take advantage of that. We want to make sure. How many of you know this isn't the end of what God's going to do with their life, but just the beginning? Just the beginning. That is awesome. Now, as I mentioned, normally we're going to be done each night making that invitation before nine. You'll not hurt my feelings if you have uh, something that uh, demands your time and you need to be dismissed uh, tonight, tomorrow night, Wednesday night. We're not gonna have a formal dismissal per se because we're just gonna open the altars up for prayer because some people need prayer. And, uh, yes. But if you need to go, you'll not offend me. But uh, as we allow that opportunity for those that need to be dismissed I'd like to pray and when I pray for the sick I not only pray for people that are sick to get well I pray a blessing for people that are well to stay well because that's the covenant of divine healing I would above all things first John I would above all things that you would prosper and be in health so if you're not in good health, God wants you to be healed and to be placed in good health. If you are in good health, he wants to keep you in good health. Say this out loud. With long life, he will satisfy me. That's the bullseye. The Bible says that three score and ten should be a minimum. So 70 is a minimum. But the Bible says that by faith you have the right to believe for more. My goal is to preach all the days of my life. If the Lord tarries, I don't think he will. I'd love to come back to Soldatna at about 95 years old, still able to sing, still able to play my guitar, still able to preach like a house on fire, still in my right mind. Nobody wheeling me down the aisle in a wheelchair with live jello dripping off of my lip. Riding a go-kart in Walmart. No, I want to be healthy and fit all the days of my life. So if you need to be dismissed, that liberty is yours. Those of you, however, that would like this prayer, I want you to just come and stand across the altar, and I'm going to pray this prayer of healing and health and sustenance. Come on in Jesus' name. Just form across the altar. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now listen, if there are individuals who because of sickness, disease, pain, or infirmity, if it is difficult for you to stand, feel free to sit in a seat. That's not a lack of faith. I don't want you to be down here in an endurance test that's beyond your control and I say that because there are individuals who have had surgeries, individuals that are elderly, individuals that are suffering with it's painful even for some people to stand so if you need to sit it won't hurt my feelings at all God can heal you sitting down that man that I mentioned in Fitchburg Massachusetts was sitting down in a wheelchair for 26 years but he got out of it and walked home and has walked home ever since God is a God of signs and wonders and miracles. Now just before I pray, it matters what you believe. It matters what you hear. 
You've heard tonight, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And you've heard tonight that everything about Jesus represents the will of God exactly. And the Bible says he healed all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. So we're going to pray together. And one of the things I'm going to ask you to pray is a statement of faith. Is just to raise a hand to God by faith and pray a simple prayer as I begin to pray for you. And that prayer is this. Father, tonight, I believe you want me well. Baby steps of faith. But you have to believe that and declare that and speak that over your life. Because if the devil for one minute can convince you that what you're going through was sent by God to make you a better person or to strengthen your faith, you'll never pray in faith believing because you're always going to have that question mark in your heart as to what to believe. And if somebody has falsely taught you that you're going through infirmity because God wants to strengthen your faith, you're never going to be able to stand upon the promises of God. So, Father, we raise our hands to heaven. And we declare it is the will of God for us to be healthy, saved, secure, delivered, well, blessed. For you said in the Bible, and the Bible is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. You would above all things that we would prosper, be in health, even as our soul prospers. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that the same blood of Jesus Christ that forgives our sins heals our bodies. Heals our bodies. I bind every sickness, disease, and infirmity within the sound of my voice. I bind every sickness, disease, and infirmity within the sound of my voice. And I command the healing fire of God from the top of every head to the sole of every foot to the tip of every finger. And I command God's people to be made well. I curse every work of the devil in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whatever attack of the enemy has come against the children of God. I lay my hands upon them. Whatever the devil would try to do to attack Brother Ed's life and rob him of long, satisfying life, I curse it tonight in the name of Jesus. I command it to be broken loose off of his body. Let the fire of God that heals purge through him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, to the tips of his fingers. Let him be made every whit whole. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I release the healing power of the Lord for your people. I thank you, Father, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's not your will for us to suffer and to be in pain and to lose sleep and to wonder what you're going to do. I release the fire of God into this body. I reverse the curse in the name of Jesus and everything the devil's trying to steal out of his life. I release the power of God to make him well. We draw a line in the sand in the name of Jesus and pray that your people would be healed all the days of their life. No sickness, no disease, no pain, no infirmity. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickened every mortal body for the glory of God. For the glory of God. For the glory of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lay my hands upon my brother Jim and I release strength, stamina, healing in the name of Jesus. I pray that because of the strength that he's sown into the kingdom of God and this house in particular, that it would be like seed sown in the presence of the Lord, that it will come back to him in a great harvest in his old age.
that he'll be different than everybody else, that he'll have that favor and blessing of the Lord that will follow him in his coming in and his going out, and upon his precious wife as well. We release that favor of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I pray that you keep your hand upon me and that you give her a brand new heart. Take away the broken heart and the questioning heart and the wandering heart and give her a new heart of faith and joy and peace and love. Let the presence of God touch her in a way that she'll never be the same. In the mighty name of Jesus. For Johnny, I pray tonight, oh God, that you keep your hand upon him. No spirit of sickness, disease, or infirmity to take one of his appointed days. All the days of his life, the supernatural sustaining power of the Lord. Keep him healthy. Keep him holy. Keep him pure under the coming of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we worship you and praise you that you are the God of heaven and the God of earth the creator of the human body. The psalmist said, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? I pray that you would visit your people tonight. For those that are well, give them the keys to staying well. For those that need changes in their life, let the Holy Spirit teach them and tutor them as to what change needs to be made. But for the glory of God, let the children of the Lord's lives be different. I curse every power of the devil and I release the glory of God to do the will of the way and the works of your holy precious work. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Now just by faith raise a he hand to heaven and thank God for what you're believing him for even before you receive it. Say I thank you Lord that I receive it by faith even before I receive it in reality, I receive it by the power of prayer. I receive it by the covenant of the Bible. I receive it by the promise of the Lord. I receive it in my spirit before I receive it in my body. But I receive it tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, receive ye the fire of the Holy Spirit. Receive the mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Receive a heavenly language. Receive a fresh outpouring. In the name of Jesus, we release the power of signs, wonders, miracles. We release the power of the Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, Holy Ghost like fire, come upon your people. We give you glory. God, we pray for our young people. We pray for our sons. We pray for our daughters. We pray for our grandchildren. We pray for every boy and girl that ever walks into this sanctuary. That they have served the Lord all the days of their life. Bless them. Bless their homes. In the name of Jesus. Teach our young people to pray. Teach our young people to believe. Teach our young people to be men and women of faith. Men and women of the Spirit, even in their childhood. Cause them to walk in the power of God. We give you glory for it tonight. We give you glory for it tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. Just give him praise tonight by faith. Take some time to worship him and praise him. Learn how to thank him for things before you have them in hand. We thank you, Lord, today. We thank you, Lord, today. Everything in the Bible that you've said is true. We give you praise tonight. Wind of the Holy Spirit. Blow upon this house. Send Holy Ghost rains in this house. Let this be a lighthouse on the Kenai Peninsula. Send a spiritual awakening to every Bible-believing church. Send fresh fire and oil to every pastor. 
I pray you'd set every preacher on fire in the name of Jesus. Let something happen in pulpits this coming Sunday. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Those of you that are able, let's take time to pray for rain here in Alaska to stop these fires. Father, in the name of Jesus, we continue to pray that you'd send rain to the state of Alaska. I pray, oh Father, that you'd gather the rain clouds by your hands, you who created heaven and earth. It is an easy thing for you to send the rain. We pray for a great release of rain in the state of Alaska. Put out these fires, we pray. I pray nobody's home within the sound of my voice would be burned down by the fire, but preserved by the angels of the Lord. Not one thing that they own, not one property, not one possession, damaged, but protected by the hand of God. Supernaturally, send the rains, O oh Lord, we pray. Wash the smoke out of the air. Let there be something in Alaska that would be a testimony for the glory of God. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Cooper's Landing, they're telling me, is evacuating as we pray. Let's pray. Father, we pray somehow that you move there in that area. No loss of life. Don't let one man, woman, boy, or girl be harmed in Cooper's Landing. Wherever those fires are burning, we pray in the name of Jesus for divine protection. Send angels of the Lord. The Bible says that the angels of the Lord are ministering spirits sent forth for those who are the heirs of salvation. I pray, O oh God, that you would stop those fires, that you would protect the firefighters, protect all of those that are working on behalf of this state to protect and to preserve. Let rains from heaven come to Alaska in the name of Jesus. Turn those fires around. Quench those fires. Let the breath of heaven put them out. If necessary, in the name of Jesus. We pray for a Holy Ghost fire in its place. We pray for a Holy Ghost fire in its place. We pray for a Holy Ghost fire in its place. Put out natural fire and give a supernatural fire in the name of Jesus. Let Alaska burn with the fire of the Holy Ghost in its place. Sweep over Alaska by the fire of the heavens of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost of Pentecost. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, we give you praise and honor and glory. We give you praise and honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, lift the voice of praise. Come on, lift the voice of praise. He's worthy of our praise. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath, the Bible says, praise ye the Lord. Father, we praise you tonight. In the name of Jesus, we praise you tonight. We give you glory for all that you've done. We humble our hearts in your holy presence. We give all praise, all honor, all glory to Jesus Christ alone is worthy of praise in the mighty name of Jesus we lift our voice that you have preserved and protected and declare our God is great our God is awesome our God is mighty our God is holy our God reigns our God reigns we give him praise tonight great is our God great is our God and greatly to be praised in the precious name of Jesus in the precious name of Jesus. In the precious name of Jesus. We give you praise tonight, oh God. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Then sing my soul. My Savior, to Thee, how great, how great Thou art! Then sing. 
Hallelujah. 